was wonderful. That was beautiful. Uh, most of you all know me. If not, my name is Rick. Mr. Rick, the mailman. Mariana's dad. Woo! <laughs> the mailman! <laughs> the mailman, yes. And uh, I have been... <laughs> I have been asked to start off the series about uncensored relationships, sex, dating, pornography, and how we should uh, call ourselves and, and act uh, in a way that is appropriate towards worshiping and trusting in God. Uh, in my studies, it has been quite uh, challenging. It has been very fruitful for me as well. Uh, one of the things that I came across is the biggest challenges facing the, our youth today, you all. And I, I have uh, the top 10 here. And we'll see if you agree or disagree. Personalizing and living out your faith. Would you say that's difficult on a daily basis? Living in an anti-Christian culture. Sexual purity in, an in society where pressure and temptations exist. Personal identity, self-image issues. Divorce and family issues. Busyness. Always being involved in something, not really having a lot of quiet time. Right? I have a lot of problem with that. Absence of a father figure. Negative media influence. I think we can all agree with that over the past year. Lack of discipline. Materialism. Materialism is the accumulation of things because you want to have the biggest TV, you want to have the, the PS5, the new, newest editions of everything coming out. Materialism. This list was created 10 years, uh, nine, 2019, no, 2012, nine years ago. And it's still some of the same problems that you all are facing today. So I think it's great to have this opportunity at our church to be able to instruct, give instructions, to give you a, a clear understanding of how we are called to be in this, cult in this culture and a worldview. But one of the main things that I want to get you all to understand is definitions. You know, definitions have an impact on our life. If we don't understand a word to its fullness, then how can we live out that, that life, right? So what is culture? What is a worldview? Culture is defined as a behavioral and educational development, a way of life. Right? It's a patterns of thoughts, beliefs, uh, art, literature, dress, language, uh, music. It involves worldviews, social structures, institutions that give meaning to life. Right? That's our culture here in America. You can think about the things that, that the uh, society tells you is a good thing to do, something that you shouldn't be doing. Right? A worldview is the deepest level of culture, an outlook on life, what's wrong and right, and how functions or how things should function to be normal. Right, so that's a worldview. So right now we are uh, in, in a conflict between a battle of worldviews. You have a cultural worldview, society tells you one thing, and we have a biblical worldview, one that we take out of the Bible, we read, we, we try to cultivate that type of living. But right now, what I think is escaping us is understanding that we are implementing our cultural society values into the biblical worldview, and it's distorting it in a way. So let's, let's, let's go down with the differences. There's five questions that you can ask to, uh, in a difference between the cultural worldview and the biblical worldview. Who are we? Where are we? What is wrong? And what's the solution? So in a cultural worldview, in your society right now, when you're growing up in, in school, if you're uh, in public schools, uh, as you go and grow older, get into high school and get into colleges, who are we from a cultural standpoint? We're physical beings, a product, a product of evolution. We started from randomness, right? There was just, there was a big bang, everything created, and we just evolved over millions of years into what we are now. That's what we are. There, there's no meaning in life. We just, we live, we play, 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 play hard, and then we die. There's really no ultimate meaning to that. Where are we? We're on Earth. We have no point of reference outside of ourselves. There's no creator. In a, in a cultural worldview, there's no need for a creator. We, they can exp we can explain everything through science, through evolution. And this is something that is being 
taught to you all heavily in school, especially as you get into high school and, and uh, college. Where are we? No, I already said that, sorry. What is wrong? We do not manage ourselves or the environment very well. Think about it right now, we have uh, climate change. Uh, we are overpopulated, we have too much carbon, uh, gas, everything. We're just humans are just destroying the world, right? What's the solution? We need to find some type of goodness within ourselves so that we can change the outcome and stop having these problems or else the world's going to end in 12 years. It's just a joke. From a biblical worldview, who are we? Anybody? This is the participatory part of the program. Who are we? Followers of Christ. Followers of Christ. Children of God. We were made in the image of God, right? Genesis. Genesis 1.27. He created us in his, in, in his image. Where are we? <laughs> we're on earth. It's a beautiful world, but it's fallen, right? We, we live in a fallen uh, nature. What is wrong? There's a lot of sin in the Because we rebelled against God, right? That's Gen uh, Genesis... Uh, Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that was forbidden. All right, what is the solution? Jesus died, he was born, he died, and he resurrected. All right, he gave us a purpose. We are a new creation in him. Understanding the different worldviews will reflect the way you think, talk, act, and your relationships. Uh, the world tells you that you should live for yourself that you should love yourself, live for yourself, do what's best for you. The Bible says you need to die to yourself. Right? Anybody who lives their life will lose their life. Right? Uh, Matthew 16, 24. Culture says do whatever you want, unrestricted. It means you can do anything you want because you're, you're the owner of your own life, you live your life, whatever you want. I mean, the... Pandora's box is open of things that you can and can, cannot do, right? Biblical perspective tells us we should cultivate the right wants. You know, what do we want reflects what God wants for our life. The world tells us that you should just love yourself. You know, Nike, just do it. There's only one of you. Get, your, get out of your own head and... and Go out there and be a go-getter. You can win whatever you want. Be as fast as you want. You are your best person now. That's what the world tells you. The Bible tells you you should love others as you love yourselves. Right? There's no real truth. It's all relative. Right? That's why we can be in a world fascinated with boys being girls, girls being uh, guys, you can just see the messed up society that we live in. There's no gender anymore, right? What's up is down, what's down is up, right? A biblical worldview, there is truth, and that truth is in Jesus Christ. So I have a few questions for you to ponder on and think about. Later on, you'll go with your leaders and, and maybe kind of hash out some of these, these questions, concerns you have. How do I seek God and his kingdom in my relationships with other people? All right. What does it mean to truly love God and love other people? You know, how do I know what that means, what that looks like? Are you willing to give up some things in our culture that says they are good in order to do what God says what is best? That's a hard, difficult question to answer. And I'm sure a lot of the leaders and adults here can say that's very hard for them too. Are you prepared to sacrifice certain worldly pleasures for the sake of faithfulness to Christ? Now, this, these are all broad questions. Uh, I want to try to engage them within the next month as far as relationships go, as far as dating, sex, what, what sex is good, is it, uh, is it bad? You know, if sex is not allowed, uh, what about oral sex or other things? Pornography, is that okay? Yeah, these are some tough questions and embarrassing. 
But one of the reasons why we are doing this as a church is because we are allowing as a church and as mothers and fathers to let the school system tell you what's good about it, to let social media tell you what you should and shouldn't do, how you can and cannot act, acts that are appropriate. We're not engaging in these conversations as leaders and as parents a lot of time, and you're learning through school, social media, movies, music. And we want to change that. We want to get involved. So when you have questions, we're here to answer them for you. Because I promise you, and I, I say this to, the, uh, this to my seventh, eighth graders all the time, I promise you, there's nothing that you're going through right now that we haven't gone through already. I can promise you that. The same questions, concerns, thoughts that you have now, I've been there, done that, and I'm not proud of it. Right? I've lived a life contrary to a biblical standard, and I've suffered because of that. And I'm still learning and I'm still growing even as an adult, as a father, as a deacon, as a teacher for you all, I'm still learning. So don't think that I have all the answers or Tommy has all the answers. We don't, but we know where to go for the answers, right? That's what we want to, to teach you all. Christ never deluded anyone into thinking it would be easy to follow him. The hardships prevent boredom. If you believe it's boring, then, you have, then have you really taken God's invitation to taste and see what the Lord, that the Lord is good? Psalm 34, 8. Instead, selfishly pursue whatever you think will make you not bored or happy or content. Things of this world are temporary, and you can never truly satisfy. It leaves you with a constant yearning. All right, that's a quote from uh, Dr. Sean McDowell. Here's an example. Who here knows Tom Brady? Tommy, put your, put your hand down, Tom. Brady's quarterback of all time. All right. Back, at, back whenever he had his third Super Bowl ring, he said, I reached the goal. I got three rings. There's got to be more than this. What else is there for me to do? You're talking about a guy that reached the pinnacle of his career. Since then, he's won, what, three more? Three, three more, three more. <laughs> since then. But you got a you got a guy that's on top of the world, winning Super Bowls galore, and he's still saying that there has to be more than just searching for this materialistic, worldly idea of what it means to be satisfied. You got King Solomon, who said, "All is vain." I mean, King Solomon, one of the richest guys in biblical times, had everything you can imagine, money, women, sex, everything, he had it. And he said, all of it is vanity. Without God, there's nothing else to have. If you think the Christian life is just a, a life filled with boredom, then let me ask you these things. Do you just have a lack of, excite of excitement? What can you get excited about? I like skydiving. I can do that as a Christian, right? I love whitewater rafting. I like playing sports. I like beating people at foosball, right? That's not boring. Inactivity, maybe you're just inactive. Get out there and do something. Are you in, uninterested in anything, right? Maybe there's a lack of understanding of the character of God. Who do you think God is and what is his character? Now, I've been doing a, a, a study on the attributes of God, God's love, his holiness, wrath, justice, and I can tell you it is mind-boggling to think of God in this manner. It really puts a, puts a perspective on how little I am compared to the, the vast majesty of God. If God isn't good, then he's a cosmic killjoy. Right? Think about it. If God's not good, then he's just out there to steal away your fun. Right? He's controlling. He's oppressive. And whatever you want to do is fun. He says it's not, and it's just, like, why bother? But if God is good, then you are free to trust him. His plans are the best, and it gives you uh, the ability to receive genuine love and obedience in him. 
So let me ask you, what is your view of God? Do you have this little view of God where he's like a genie in the bottle and he's supposed to be there and give you good things and when he's not, then, well, just push him aside? All right. This is probably sounds like lecturing, right? A lot of definitions, a lot of terms, and, and probably not where you expected it to go considering what uncensored means. Right? But first, we've got to lay down the foundation, right? We've got to understand where we are and what we believe. Uh, right now, I'm convinced that we are here and our belief system is more aligned with what culture and society says is good and bad, more so than what we know the, tri the Bible speaks is true. Right? If you think about relationships, if you think about sex and these things, you're more inclined to believe what society is telling you rather than what the Bible says. Right? And the Bible says Jesus is the cornerstone. He is that brick at the very corner that allows the foundation to set and be solid for the rest of us, his church. Right? How do you have a fulfilling relationship with someone if you don't understand the most important relationships to have and cultivate with God? What is the most important commandment according to Jesus? Anybody? Love your neighbor as yourself. Is there one before that? Honor your father and your mother. If any, does anybody have your sword? Who has your sword? This is your sword, right? If everybody has your sword, open your Bible to Mark 12, 28, 31. If you don't have it, that's fine. I am going to read it, so you're good. Mark 12, 28 through 31. All right. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love your Lord, your God, with all, your heart, all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what does it mean to love? Right. How do you express love to somebody? And, and that's what I want to get into, relationships. As far as relationships go, how do you love somebody? Well, Jesus loved us so much that he came and he died for us. That's an expression of love. Right? In Ephesians 5, you don't have to go there, but Ephesians 5, 25 through 29, it lays out a, what it looks like to love for a husband and a, and a wife in a union of marriage right? between a man and a woman. It says to love your wives as Christ loved the church, to honor her. John 15, 12, 14 says to love someone, you would lay down your life for them. It means you love them so much that you would be willing to die for them. Right? I love my wife. I love my children. If the opportunity ever came, as sad as it would be, I would exchange my life for theirs. I love them deeply. Right? not saying that you, to love somebody that you're going to die. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But understand what the value of love is before you go out there and start relationships with uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, and stuff, and throwing out the L word thinking you love them. The main scripture that I want to get into that we are going to be in the most is 1 Corinthians 13. Now, if you do have your Bibles, I would like you to go there and stay there. Paul here outlines what love is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Right? What is the point of uh, a relationship? Who in here has or has had a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Right. What's the point of having a, a girlfriend? Somebody other than PJ. <laughs> What's the point of having a girlfriend? Right. No, nobody? A guy. Uh, PJ. What's the point of a girlfriend? Uh, to prepare for marriage. To prepare for marriage. Right. Who in here, raise your hands, is ready for marriage? Exactly. <laughs> Nobody here is ready for marriage, so why have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Think about it. Why have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Are you prepared to, to be married? Are you prepared to leave the house, to be on your own, to support your husband or wife, have kids, get your job? Are you ready at this time to support them? No, you're not. There's still a lot of growing, a lot of learning to do. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't have them? It's not my place as a teacher. Uh, I do believe there is no biblical basis for youth at your age to have one. Uh, there's a certain age that I think is appropriate. Are you mature enough? Are you able to, to have boundaries set, lay those boundaries? One thing right now, you're still under the protection of your parents and your family. All right. the ver one of the first questions that, that I asked was, how do I seek God in his kingdom in my relationship with other people? You may want to go out and have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Right? You, you may want to. And you go to your parents and they say no. Well, what do you do? Do you go behind their back? and dishonor God in your relationship? What, what, what does one of the commandments say? You should honor your mother and father. Right? Doesn't always mean that you have to agree with what they say. You may not understand the, the meaning behind their rules and what they think, but one way that you can honor God is by honoring your parents. That means if they ask you to do something and ask you not to do something, Listen to them, abide them in them. You will honor God in that way, and that will show your parents that you are growing in maturity and have at least a, a little understanding that, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I can trust that my mom and dad are doing what's best for me. Right. One of the things that I loved, I don't typically like to put myself in scripture. You know, you hear a lot of pastors say, well, what does this passage mean to you? I don't particularly like that. The, pad, the Bible is meant to show Jesus in our lives, and it can uh, affect us in a way, and we can see how we should act in a certain way. But one, uh, one person that I was following was like, in this passage alone, the person, think about your boyfriend or girlfriend that you have right now, and think about if they love you. All right, let do this. Replace every time you see love in this passage, with their name, all right? So Tommy is patient, <laughs> Tommy is kind. <laughs> it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor love, it's love. Heather is not self-seeking, Heather is not easily angered. Uh, in this passage, take that person that you are in a relationship with and replace it with their name. Are they these, are, do they display these acts? Let's, let's think about a time, guys, are you pressuring girls into sending pictures that are inappropriate? Are you saying, are you telling them that, hey, they should do this for you, come here closer and, and, and give me a kiss or let me, let me hold your hand or let me rub your leg? It, it's going to be weird, but is that a way that they show love to you? If pressuring you to do something that you definitely don't want to do, is that loving? No, it's not love. That's selfish desire. That's lust. I find it funny that in the Bible, 
not funny, but in the Bible, in Ephesians 6, it says that we are to stand firm and rebel and fight against Satan. Right? He gives us the whole armor of God, and we are told you need to stand firm. Do not let Satan grab a foothold. Right? But whenever it comes to sex, sexual immorality in our lives, what does it tell us to do? It says to flee. It says to run away as fast as you can. Now, you're telling me that the Bible is telling us that Satan who is a master liar, a cunning thief, we can stand up against the sexual desires and immorality we're supposed to run away from? It tells me that our heart, which is deceitfully wicked, something that is within us, that ha that's our desires, we're to, to watch over, be cautious with it. If you get into a position where you're in a, a, a lustful environment, you need to run away. I mean, hands down, just run away. What is love? How does that affect our relationships? Are you loving to the opposite sex? Are you loving to your friends? Let's, let's make this even broader. Are you loving to your parents? Are you patient with them? Are you kind? If you want something, you don't get your way, do you get angry and yell at them? Right? That's a, a, a parent-child relationship, right? Friends, when you're with your friends, are you stabbing jokes at them, putting them down, even though it's funny? You know, if one person doesn't find it funny, it's probably not a funny joke, putting that out there. Is that loving, is that kind? Or is that, so, uh, that self-receiving? Relationships. But next week, we're going to go further into uncomfortable talk. Just going to lay this out now. We are going to get uncomfortable. You all are, not me so much. But we're going to talk about sex, the dynamic of it, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. We're going to get into pornography, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Right. My whole point that I want to get across is what is biblical, what is not? How do we act and treat our loved ones and how we should not? Are you in a relationship with God? So much so that you have a love for other people above yourself. If you do not, that's fine. That's what we're here for. Ask questions. Help us lead you to understanding. Who here likes sports? Who here plays sports? Who, like, who, who plays uh, musical instruments? That includes singing, right? Who here actually plays an actual sport outside of just recreation? Okay. What do you play? Volleyball. Volleyball. Football. Football. You ride horses? You ride horses? Okay, that's very competitive, all right? I play basketball. Too. Basketball, okay. Sometimes soccer and baseball. Soccer and baseball? I didn't hear you. Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu. Ah. I like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. All right. Now think about these sports, these activities. If you sing, you play band, or you, you play an instrument, rather, in a band, you do sports. How often do you practice that? Every day? Every day. Hours sometimes in a day? Right. You cultivate that experience so that you can become the best player you can or the best singer or you, you play a mean violin, right? Or if you're from the South, a fiddle, right? Yeehaw. Yeehaw, right? right? You put in the work, you put in the hours for that. Let me ask you this. How often do you keep God in your life? 
How often do you read his word, pray? A couple of hours on Wednesday, maybe? A couple of hours on Sunday? If you're going to have a walk with Christ, don't you think that there should be some type of commitment there as far as a relationship with him? If you don't have that relationship with God, then your relationship with other people could very well be like how Tom Brady felt his, his rings were. There's got to be more than this. It's going to be empty. I submit to you, if you want to live a Christ-like life, be a born-again Christian, I'm not talking or saying that it has to be a set of rules. You have to do this. You have to do that. No. But you should yearn and want to. You should want to have that, that relationship with him, to cultivate it with him. Right? Read his word. Study his word. In doing that, you will have, find that you have a better outlook on life. Maybe you can actually see the love in your life through your relationships with others. Progressive. Right, Parker? All right. I'm going to end it now so that we can actually have more time in a small group so that we can actually talk and discuss. I want you to, to consider this and think about it. You take all that time to practice to do sports, because you love it. Right? Jesus said he loved you so much, but he didn't practice it. He obeyed it on death on a cross. And just like Paul said, if he died on the cross, rose and was resurrected, then our faith is based and found in truth. We should recognize that and be obedient. God said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He also said, I want to give you life and give, it, give you life abundantly. Doesn't mean that it has to be boring, that you can't do certain things. Think about it, please. This is your eternity. This is not just death. This is your soul. It is very important to God, and it is very important to us. We do not want to lose their soul because of a lack of understanding or, or a lack of will to follow God. That's why we're here. Now, I jest with the guys a lot and make jokes and, and, and are fun, funny with them. I love them. I love them as my own sons. I know the teachers here. They love you as your own daughters, their own daughters. So there's nothing that you can't talk to them about. And in these next couple, few weeks, there's going to be some questions that you're going to have. Don't be afraid to ask them. It may sound funny, you know, some, are, some people may giggle or laugh or say you, but they're thinking the same questions. They're just too afraid to admit it. All right, let's have those questions. Let's have those conversations. So I don't want you learning from a secular culture and then you learn the hard way that that was not glorious, that you ended up with, with something that you just should not have had. Now, I've made the mistakes. Tommy's made the mistakes. Heather's made those mistakes. We have the wisdom to know and to be able to share that with you so that you don't have to have that same struggle as we did. And that's why we're here. All right. All right let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. God, the, the love that you have shown us on that cross, that as Paul says, while we were yet sinners, you still loved us. God, help us to cultivate those relationships with others. Help us to, to learn and apply.
apply and study in your word to give us the understanding to be able to, to grow and mature our faith and our love for friends, for dating, for our families. God, just be with us, guide us, give us discernment and wisdom in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.